In today's episode, oh my goodness, I have such an insightful, and I want to call it an insightful conversation today with Peter Potashko. Peter is, in my words, I would describe a leader, a change agent, and a trailblazer in social change. He is the founder of Cambio, the House of Social Change. He's a board member. Um, I'm not even going to try and list all the things that Peter does and is involved with because you're going to hear him unpack it in the conversation. But why I call this an insightful conversation is because Peter really talks to us very honestly about using his power, his privilege, his experience to drive change for others who are underrepresented. He speaks about being very aware of when he has felt included and when he has felt excluded and understanding how to challenge, manoeuvre that and sometimes walk away when he's recognised that actually the organisations that he's been involved with at board level may not have been ready for the changes that he's wanted to see. Peter really takes you on a journey for our conversation about how no matter what level you're working at, no matter where you feel you are in our wider society, you can do something to drive change for social good. I learned so much from this conversation. You will learn so much from this conversation. And we must, must, must have Peter back sometimes next year because I think I'd love to talk to the audience in the way that he invites you to have a conversation with him too about what you've taken away from this conversation. I, I wanted to write notes. I wanted to bang the table. Um, it just really energised me. So I'll say no more and let you listen. Hi, Peter. Hello. Hello. It's so good to have you here. Welcome to Bravery in the Boardroom. Um, as usual, before we go any further, it will be great for our audience to know a little bit more about you and what you do. Thank you, Monique, and thank you for having me today. It's much, much appreciated. It's a, a, real, a real treat just before Christmas, actually, yeah. um, to be back in Birmingham. So um, my name is Peter Potashka, and I've worked in social enterprise now for about 15 years, and I'll say a bit more about that uh, during the, the podcast itself. Um, my real interest is in social change mm -hmm. and the different avenues and opportunities there are to create that. So I run a consultancy practice called Cambio, uh, and what we do is we coach uh, social entrepreneurs to start and then thrive. Um, we work with uh, third-party organizations to help uh, build investment opportunities, networks, um, incubation models, again, to support those individuals to have a real success in their uh, business idea, in their scale-ups. Uh, but we also work with bigger organizations like corporates in terms of um, ESG, so environment, social and governance mm -hmm. issues. Mm -hmm. So we're working across the whole spectrum of business, but it's all um, with a view to creating more social change and creating platforms to amplify that change. And that's what I've been doing over the last 15 years, really. Okay. So unpack it for me a little of bit. Of course, yeah. So social change, talk to me about that term. Yeah, I mean, all of this can feel quite technical when I, I sort of teach entrepreneurship or, or work with entrepreneurs. And in reality, actually, it's um, much more artistic and creative, I think. Uh, what we're dealing with here is um, you know, small businesses, people, individuals often really who have a passion for to make a difference. Yes. And really it's about what, how do we make that sustainable okay. intellectually, but also financially. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore, what support can I give them to go to the next level? How can I unleash their talents that are probably within them already innate yeah. in order for them to succeed? That is, that's my mission. And if they succeed, then I succeed. Yeah. And if they don't, then how do I do what I do better next time round? Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that. I yeah. love that. I love that. So... Before we go any further, first question I usually ask guests after you tell us a little bit about what you do is your leadership style, because you absolutely are a leader in this space. So how would you describe your leadership style in three words? Yeah, it's funny. I don't normally think of myself as a leader, but, um, you know, I, I guess that comes from working with a diverse group of people. I work with very different people on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. um, if I were to describe it in three words, um, the first word would be, I'm a listener. I do a lot of listening. Uh, and I listen very carefully to what I'm hearing and what I'm not hearing as well yes. in the clients that I work with and the partners that I work with. Um, the second one would be, I think, inclusive. Mm -hmm. And that really stems from my own background, having lived in other countries, um, being gay, having a partner um, from another part of the world where we've lived uh, and worked. So I, I've seen the world from different perspectives. And although I have a lot of privilege, I think... I have a sense of what is and isn't inclusive and when I am and I'm not being inclusive. So yes. I think I'm an inclusive leader at my best. Yes. I think um, the third aspect I would say is I'm, I'm quite ambitious as well. So um, and that can work both ways. I, I, I'm always looking for the next 
opportunity to create more impact or work with interesting mm-hmm. and exciting people. Um, and so therefore that's kind of my innate driver or motivation. How do we create more impact in different and diverse ways with new and exciting people? Okay, I, I want to come. I want. I'm mm. going to come back to you about your um, what sparked your passion. But before mm. I go there, it would be really good. Could you take us on a journey? Yeah. So, so how have you got to where you are now? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of luck involved, uh, as I guess is the case of the best journeys. Um, I, I mean, going back to university, I was the first person in my family to go to university, and I was very lucky growing up in in Nottingham in in the 80s and 90s. Uh, it, it's a, it was a tough place there's been a lack of investment for many years and there weren't um, great opportunities, great schools my parents sent me to and so I, I was very lucky to go to a great school um, be around some very smart kids and that really kind of pushed me on I guess yeah. uh, and I hadn't thought about going to university until everybody around me was talking about you know, going to Oxford or Cambridge or another Russell Group institution and I was mm. like okay, well then I guess that's what we should be doing um, it felt like the right thing to do, but um, it was only when I actually got to um, the University of Warwick, where I, I studied my undergrad, that I realised the kind of opportunity that that mm-hmm. really presented, mm-hmm. and it opened my eyes to people from around the country and then actually around the world that I hadn't really had access to in Nottingham, which felt quite safe, but also very quite isolating as well, yeah. to a degree. Um, if I add onto that the fact that I you know, had known I was gay for a long time but had only come out at university, that was also very um, transformative for me in terms of how I saw myself in relation to the world around me and how I'd sort of internalised some of the discrimination that I'd found myself sort of in the middle of it in a school environment and was then able to really be myself probably for the first time. Mm. And it felt quite late at the time because when you're 18, everything feels late. Obviously, <laughs> looking back now, that perhaps wasn't quite as late as I thought. Um, and it kind of went from there. I just felt like that unlocked so much opportunity. I feel like education is so key. That's why I spent a lot of my career working in and around education because it did so much for me. Yes. Um, and I felt so fortunate to have had that experience. And really, the career fell out of that in that I, I started a social enterprise at university without having any idea what it was. Okay. I started a, a second-hand book sale. Okay. Yeah. Um, I just thought it was a good thing to do to sell textbooks back to students at a lower price to give them a, an opportunity. And, um, you know, we, we made, I think, £25,000 in seven hours. Oh, wow. And we had 4,000 students kind of queuing around the block for that. Uh, I had no idea the potential. We had like a mini water stones on our hands, basically, yeah, for about a day. Yeah. And um, ever since then, I thought, well, this is really interesting. What, mm. what more can we do with this? And honestly, my first job, um, which was unlimited here at the UK Foundation for Social Entrepreneurs based in London, I was looking in the middle of the Guardian newspaper um, and in the middle of the job ads page, they, they had this orange advert mm-hmm. and all the other adverts were in grey and I just spotted it and thought, oh, this, this is social enterprise. This is kind of what I think I might have been doing. Let's go for an interview. And I got the job and kind of the rest was history. So there's a lot of luck in, involved in looking at the newspaper at the right moment, just with that colourful advert. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but things kind of ran from there. And I feel quite fortunate because there's a lot of luck involved in that part of the story, I think. Luck involved, but also taking the opportunity, I think is what I hear there as well. So, yeah, that's what I would point out. Yeah. What supported you? So what mm. helped you to get this? You're explaining the sort of steps, but what yeah. helped you to kind of, because there's, there's a whole thing that happened, I think, between going to Unlimited yeah. and then where you are now. So what's helped you? It's a great question, actually, because I think I felt that I was very fortunate to have the love and support of my parents in terms mm. of, you know, going to a good school and going to university at a time when that wasn't a given or or easy to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and without that, you know, financial support, frankly, it would none of that would have been possible. But, you know, we, we grew up on a working class estate in Nottingham, um, which you wouldn't know from my accent now, but uh, it's all kind of disappeared mm-hmm. in sort of London. Uh, but, you know, they didn't have access to any networks or, you know, my mum worked in... The, in um, the uh, agriculture and fisheries part of the civil service for a whole career um, and my dad started a, a kind of haulage logistics business and so you know they hadn't been to university um, they didn't really have a network that they could share with me so I kind of made that my own and so really what helped me obviously was their love and support and you know kind of financial support early on and then when I got to university it was about you know make your own networks meet mm-hmm. people I was lucky it's, it was a very international place, you know, people around the world have stayed in touch with many of those people 15, 20 years later. Um, 
but I kind of had to make my own way. And I, I think it makes you a bit more aware of the, the glass ceilings in mm-hmm. life. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think I've always been, as I said, quite ambitious to sort of see what I could do next or push myself out of my comfort zone. But I have rubbed up against that ceiling a few times. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's uncomfortable. And it, you, you think, how do I get through that? And sometimes you, it's difficult. It's tough, isn't it? Mm-hmm. And, and you see that for other people as well. And that's what's, I guess, driven me on even more. So flipping that, so let's flip it completely on what you're starting to touch on there. What were some of the challenges or, or barriers even? So calling out the ceiling as a barrier, what were some of the challenges and barriers that you faced? Um, I think, you know, uh, from a sexuality point of view, when to be obvious, I guess, and when not to be. I think there's a, as a gay man, there's an expectation around um, whether this is something you can see or not. Because I guess I, I feel quite fortunate in that it's not... Um, necessarily physical you mm-hmm. can't necessarily see it when you walk in the room mm-hmm. although you can make it more or less obvious if you want to obviously there are some aspects of um the way we look and feel and believe that are you cannot simply mm-hmm. turn on and off and i felt like at times i, I was under pressure to switch it on or off and, and to use it or not and that was a bit uncomfortable and yeah especially sort of exploring that going into a career yes um and some people would make jokes and actually you know, you'd fall into that because it was harmless and yet actually you, you thought, well, hold on, am, am I being tolerated or am I being accepted? Mm. Um, and I had a, and still have a really diverse group of friends from all over the world who um, in many cases felt, faced much more discrimination than I have. I feel like I've been yeah. quite lucky. Yeah. But you can see the higher up in your career you go, uh, I, think, I think it really matters what career you're in the less mm-hmm. diverse it is and the mm-hmm. more people think in certain types of ways mm-hmm. and say certain things that I think are clearly less inclusive and I think the challenge now is a lot of that is under the surface yeah, um, yeah, yeah. and it's harder to find it's, yeah. it's not what people say it's what they do that really yeah. counts Yeah. so that's what I've really observed And but you know I'm learning every day because the one lesson I've had in all of this is just because I'm affected by one form of discrimination doesn't mean that I've not led a very privileged life because I have but by virtue of my family really and by virtue of the friends I've, I've chosen to surround myself with there are people that haven't had the opportunity so I'm con- constantly and consciously aware of that mm, and, I, and I respect your honesty there and you saying that because um, sometimes we can have people who either want to play down their privilege or, or don't want to recognize it and I think hearing you say yes I absolutely can see in these scenarios where I have faced discrimination or inclusion uh, exclusion yeah. I also am very aware when I have privilege and I can see that that's different for other groups. There was, there was a question you asked yourself in there that I want to come back to that I mm. think is so powerful yeah. in, for people to check in on. Yeah. Am I showing up authentically? When you said, am I being tolerated here or am I being accepted? Yeah. Such a powerful question to check in on, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, running my own business, working with senior leaders as I do, mm-hmm. different sectors, different levels, uh, doing a bit of work in politics as well I'm just really aware of am I able to really speak my mind in this environment on these really important issues um, and we know that we're not short of really important issues mm-hmm. in the world today mm-hmm. or do I have to be quite guarded and diplomatic about it I've, I've sort of made a career out of being honest but diplomatic but it does it applies pressure to that honesty because it's very easy to lose the message mm-hmm. and to get caught up in the narrative that's out there and what's popular and what isn't popular in the moment yeah it's much more difficult to go against that stream yes um whether it's yeah. in private business you know you, you're in a room and the door's shut or you're in the public eye yeah it's still tough i think to get that message across for different sure. challenges for sure for sure and you yeah. know it's one of the reasons why when we we first connected yeah. about from our conversation and I was saying I'd really love for you to come on Bravery in the Boardroom because of exactly that when you were saying about you know the reality is you're using your voice and platform to bring that through but you're also sharing with our audience and aspiring senior leaders about you have to navigate it as well you know you have to navigate that to get your message landed to to get the change that you're looking for to speak up for those who are not in the room. So I really hear you and you're not saying you don't do it, but also you're experienced enough at that level to know how to try and maneuver that to get the best impact as well. I think that's right. I think I'm quite self-aware of that. And whether it be in my with my clients, yeah, I've been lucky enough to work with people like um, sort of Microsoft or, or Bupa or Sage. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, of course, those aspiring entrepreneurs that are looking to grow a business in that direction. Yeah. But I also sit on a number of boards um, 
outside of my, my sort of formal business. So I sit on the board of a school, um, a NHS foundation trust, mm. uh, but also a, a charity in Manchester. Um, it's about sort of 17 million pounds turnover and, and they're all very different challenges, yeah. but they all provide opportunities, I think, in terms of the sorts of stakeholders and beneficiaries they work with. So often it's young people, obviously people in particular need um, vulnerable people in society mm. for the most part talked about the transformative power that I think education brings mm. as a link there um, but I feel a, a kind of immense responsibility as well mm. and it's very easy to get swept up into the kind of you know the doing the day to day and and to not step back um, and really re- reflect on actually what what are we really trying to achieve what's the strategy what's the kind of how are we going to make life better for the beneficiaries we're trying to work with right now there's a lot of noise Mm-hmm. And it's quite hard to cut through that sometimes, mm-hmm. I think. So you, you, you're starting to answer my question, I suppose, because one of the questions I had for you is mm-hmm. about how are you using your privilege and influence? As you just shared with us there, you know, you're a board member yeah. and you're a governor in, in a lot of different spaces. Different but spaces. there's a, I can hear there's a common thread through yeah. there as well. Um, do you feel that, let, if I ask you the question this way, do you feel you're able to influence and kind of drive and help tackle um, inequalities and discrimination in those spaces through your role as a board member? How, maybe I say, how able do you feel? Yeah, it's a great question. <laughs> I, I think the honest answer is somewhat. Um, okay. I think you do have to move yourself out of that comfort zone, often into something quite uncomfortable to mm-hmm. really challenge mm-hmm. what is often taken for granted. Mm-hmm. And you will see and hear things in those boardrooms that sometimes you need to call out. Yes. And you have to calculate, you know, how do I do that? It, yeah, am I going to be able to win this argument? And to an extent, you have to pick your battles, which I, I find, I still find quite challenging because, yeah. you know, quite often mm-hmm. you, you want to pick up everything you hear or you see that you're not happy with. Yeah. Um, but you do have to be tactical about it as well, I think, to be successful. Um, you know, and I've made mistakes. I've made mistakes where uh, I've seen things happen in organizations, I've called them out, uh, and there hasn't been any change. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, it's not all been you know a success story where you, you think okay I've made a real change here mm-hmm. sometimes I've not been able to make a change and I've had to move on mm-hmm. so I'm, I'm really conscious of that and I think the key for me is how do I how do I use that experience to make better decisions or different decisions next time around yeah and why do you say it was do you say it's do you call it you've described it as a mistake yeah do you call it a mistake because it wasn't it's because of when so it wasn't the how it was the when T- yeah. tell me more yeah I'm I think I'm, I'm inclined to make what I think think are the right decisions but sometimes without always having an end game as to how to land the decision and so it, it might be right but have I got the broader support of the organization to do it mm-hmm. uh, I think this is particularly I, I see it often when we come to talking about EDI yes uh, and I've been in far too many conversations privately where people are very surface level on what they think real inclusion particularly looks like I yes think. people are, are getting better at the e yes and the d mm-hmm. but when it comes to the i we're often yeah. really falling short and yes. people having a seat at the table but they're not actually part of the conversation yes. or, or not really part of the conversation yes or they have two tier boards or you know if we're getting to the meat of the issue now i've been involved in so many organizations where there's a two-track decision making process and you've got one track and another track and that first track is not it's not diverse in any sense of the word um so, yeah, I'm learning, which I think is a real shame, actually, that you, sometimes you just have to pick your battles and timing matters. Mm-hmm. Um, finding the right time, even if you're right, sometimes being right isn't enough. Mm. Mm. Tough. It's hard to accept. Yeah, that it, you know, and, and it's and like I said, it's brave to, to, to acknowledge that, isn't it? Yeah. You know, I really want to come back to what you just said there. Yeah. Wow, wow, wow. It's so true. Um, you know, we talk about representation by sight, right? And we say representation isn't enough just by sight. Yeah. Let's let's fast forward on what you were saying there. I understand, like you said, in some spaces, people won't know that you're a gay man. You know, they don't know that. Yeah. Um, you will choose to bring it up or you will choose to demonstrate that in whatever way you, you can if you want it to be more visible, yeah. right? So let's, let's play out that it is known. Like you just said there, you can have a seat at the table, but really, have you got equity of voice? Are yeah. you really heard or are you witnessing or experiencing that two track? I know so many people working at a senior level who've, who've fought their way into the boardroom, you know, got there on merit and they are experiencing what you just described. I'm visibly here, but 
I'm not really part of it. Um, you know, I can say something, my colleague to my right says it, I say it, nobody flinches and people act like they can't hear it. My colleague to the right says it, everyone's nodding. Yeah. It's like the best idea ever. Yeah. yeah? And, yeah. And, and that's common. In what you were saying there mm. about picking your battles, or I also heard you say, sometimes I've moved on. Mm. So putting you on the spot a little bit yeah, here, thanks. but um, what advice would you give to someone who's experiencing that now? So they're in the boardroom, they're, they're, they're underrepresented for whatever uh, protected characteristic it is that they represent there. Yeah. And they are, they know, they know yeah. I'm not in track one, I'm in track yeah. two. Yeah. I think there's a couple of, uh, ways forward from there actually first of all how do I get into track one mm -hmm. what conversations mm -hmm. do I need to be part of uh, and that somewhat depends on the role you know is it an elected role is it appointed is it interview based and it, it will vary I've, I've been part of membership organizations where you go through interview processes where it's a decision made within the boardroom so you just need to win support of the people around that table which can be hard or easy to do yeah um I think it is about you know how easy is it going to be for me to negotiate into that track one mm -hmm. Um, what and sometimes what do I need to say and do now yes. to get into that environment um, sometimes it is a bit of a trade-off in that maybe I'm saying some of the right things to get into the space to be able to say what I need to say mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it's tricky because how authentic are you mm -hmm. being and, mm -hmm. and it's, mm -hmm. it, it's 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 complex it can be uncomfortable yes. sometimes you have to walk away because it's just the organization isn't ready for that change um, that's I think the hardest thing to do actually mm -hmm. To know that you're right, but that actually doesn't matter because the organisation isn't going to change. Maybe that will happen in a few year, few years' time yeah. when the when the culture or the moment is different. Yeah, um, and we see that all the time. I think with organisations, uh, the, the one that's been in the news recently, of course, is the OpenAI mm -hmm. uh, change with Sam Altman mm -hmm. being as a CEO, having been sacked by the board, and now has been brought back all in the space of a week. And what I find really interesting about that is what's not being reported. And yes. What actually was said. Yes. You know, why did the board take the action it did? What Did he do anything? And mm -hmm. what did he do? Mm -hmm. Probably never know. It won't be mm -hmm. public. Mm -hmm. But I suspect there's more to that story than what meets the eye. It may not be about diversity necessarily. But it is, a, 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 I suspect, about how organisations are governed and how they work with senior leaders. So I, I, there must be a fascinating story in there. Mm -hmm. um, but it is at that kind of tension point between... The people at the top of the board and the people at the top of the operations, you know, CEO, C-suite colleagues, mm -hmm. that's where these really fascinating conversations are happening. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's, there's such an opportunity to make change, but you've got to get those people on the board in the first place, never mind in the conversation. We're yeah. not even seeing enough of that. Yeah. So there's a, yeah. there's a lot of work to do. Yeah. At yeah. that level, there's a lot of work to do. Yeah. And it's why we're here, you yes. know, actually to like what we talk about, to see boardrooms more representative of the yeah. communities and staff that they serve and whilst we're seeing some movement I think it's what I try and call out here it's not to be negative it's to be real about the reason why I invite leaders such as yourself to yeah. come and have conversations is because it's the representation and your values-based leadership that is important your brave leadership you know yeah. what you're advising and guiding yeah. people on here today in this conversation about how do you show up authentically yeah. how do you navigate tactically yeah. but what i heard you say here is and also how to call it when it might be time to walk away yeah. because actually i'm not going to i'm not going to be able to influence change here or this doesn't match my values and you can call that as well and i think that's powerful isn't it sometimes it sounds crazy but people forget that we can walk away and pick another battle to fight. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think it can be quite scarring as well. It, mm. In that I, yeah, I remember not that long ago, I've stepped away as a chair of a LGBT charity and because I, I felt like actually my values weren't matching where that organization was going. I, I think the organization was fairly happy to continue as it was, but the mm -hmm. change I was looking to make wasn't, they weren't ready for. Um, I felt that we weren't being really meaningfully inclusive and I felt that, you know, speaking in my community now, I think with an LGBTQ plus people, certainly as a gay male, there's, there's still far too much focus on the L and the G, particularly the G. Mm -hmm. um, and that's sort of internalized within the community. So there's a bit of internalized homophobia there. And that's it's really tough, actually. Mm -hmm. And that's the beauty in a way of such a diverse group of people. But we've not been very good at learning that actually we have to work together to create change actually within our community and outside mm -hmm. of it and actually we just don't do that enough 
Mm. We spend far too much time talking about each other and not mm. about the world. And I think that that's what I try to promote more of. Yes. Whilst retailing that kind of lived experience of, you know, who I am and, and where I've come from. Very easy to forget where you've come from, I think. Mm. Um, you, you know, whether it be the, the place that I was born or the communities that I call home or where I live or who I'm married to or, or my family, you, you can sort of brush some of that away yeah. in certain settings. And actually it's helped to shape you. Yes. And that really matters. But yeah. to come back to my point, I guess, that can leave scar tissue. It's what you do with that, I think. Um, mm-hmm. What you do next, mm-hmm. what you do differently, and how you see that as a learning opportunity rather than as a kind of, you know, you're keeping score, something that didn't work. I hear you. And, and may I ask, in terms of your own scar tissue, how have you, how have you worked through that? How have, yeah, how have you, have you, have you overcome it? Or is it something, like you said, it's who I am, I carry it with me? Yeah, it's, it's a bit of both, Monique, I think. Um, I can't tell you how many holidays I've been on where I've been on the phone or, or on an email exchange in a really difficult conversation with you know, with a client or on a on a boardroom discussion. Um, you know, how many holidays I've ruined for my, my partner mm. <laughs> on that basis. So, you know, there are there are scars that, that stay with you in terms of relationships and, and how you you live your life. It's not I think in the world that I live in I there's no such thing as an off button. <laughs> I think probably you and <laughs> some of your listeners will be able to relate to that yeah. um, and certainly running a business is no such thing as an off button yeah. you can have yeah. quieter times <laughs> <laughs> at Christmas day <laughs> Mo- mostly because other people won't be working mm-hmm. <laughs> and so it doesn't make any sense to but you know on a serious note I think um, I think I've learned now coming towards 40 mm-hmm. um, I'm 40 next year that scar tissue is just a natural result of having put yourself in difficult positions so and actually mm-hmm. if you don't do that then I'm not sure that having no scar tissue is a good thing because it means you haven't had any kind of battle wounds. You know, you've not been in that heat of battle. So mm. in a way, I think it's actually a badge of honour, but that doesn't stop it being tough and it doesn't yeah. stop those difficult moments where, yeah, for me, I've had to sit back and say, well, did I make the right decision or what What was the right decision? Was this about me and my leadership? or Was it about the community? Or, and you have to really look at yourself in the mirror. Uh, but I think at the end of that, if you can conclude that, the intention was right even if the execution wasn't always mm-hmm. the best mm-hmm. i think you can walk away and be at least reasonably proud of what you did and learn from it yeah i'm gonna come back to yeah. the um about the community mm. and the kind of infighting that you mentioned i'm gonna yeah. come back to that point yeah. but i want to pick up on so you're sharing here about yeah the, the, the life of a business owner can be exactly what you've just described many many people will resonate with what you've just said there but what drives your passion for this? I'm really intrigued to understand that what drives your passion, because you have a deep-seated passion for yeah. social change, yeah. but also, like you said, for, for, I think, if I may say it, you know, really leading to drive change yeah. and to see more inclusive environments. What drives that for you? Um, I, a couple of things. First of all, I, I often tell this is what gets me out of bed in the morning. Mm-hmm. I often talk mm-hmm. to other, you know, entrepreneurs, people that are trying to innovate, leaders, I ask them what gets you out of bed in the morning because mm. that passion is really going to help you get through. And for me, it's that drive. It's a drive for those people, actually. The chance to work with, every day, a different set of people that have a different set of challenges, hopefully provide some solutions or at least provide a, a sounding board to listen to those challenges. I get so much out of that. I get so much out of listening, as well as obviously you know coming out with my own perspectives on things. Um, I see every conversation as two way. That I think is that diversity of thought and action every single day that keeps me going. Um, and it's also the fact that I think I see a lot of injustice in society. Absolutely, I think I'm not sure anybody could say right now that um, you know living in 2023 is easy mm-hmm. uh, or fair or, or just um, to everyone. Certainly, and. Uh, I think there's opportunity to make so much change. It's way, what, what do you want to pick? You know, where do you want to start really? <laughs> and who do you want to work with? So yeah. um, for me, I want to promote and give opportunities to people to become leaders at, in organizations that need that leadership right now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because I'm afraid I see too many of our leaders in society that are not living up to the standards that I think we would all expect. So wanting to see that diversity yeah. of leadership, wanting yeah. to see talent come yes, through absolutely. as well. Yeah. Um, and yes, I agree with you. There's a lot of, there's a lot of change that's yeah. required, but 
not many have the stomach for it or the drive for it or the determination or the self-confidence or self-belief, you know, and, and that's what in, in this conversation with you, I really, I really hear quite a steely level of confidence and determination in yeah. how you work and, and what drives you. And um, there's always something that underpins a change agent. And you really spoke, I really heard what you were saying about where you started your family life, your upbringing. And I just loved yeah. your connection to where you've come from. And you're so right, Peter, in what you said about, you know, sometimes people forget that or they disconnect from it. You coming into London, like you were sharing with me before, lived in London for 20 years now, you know, like you said, you're working with lots of very senior people. Been able to see and hear from you, no, but my foundation is my core. Yep. And I bring that into the conversation and that's a key part of who I am. I think it's so powerful because we've got, we've got a lot of listeners, especially people who are underrepresented who feel like they have to wear a mask. Yep. They feel like they have to code switch, right? They feel like they have to change that. Now, I heard you talking about adapting to situations. Yeah. But what I've really heard loud and clear is your core and what underpins you. Yeah. Um, and I just think that's so powerful about when people say, um, bring your authentic self to work. And, you know, we want more authentic leadership. I really like to let people, let's have the conversation about the how. Yeah. And I really heard from you and what you've shared so far about how you do that. Yeah. Um, very, very powerful. So thank you for kind of, delving into that more with me yeah. let's let's carry on our conversation about um increasing diversity at senior level something we're both passionate about yeah um in your opinion and from being in this space what do you think should be prioritized so that we see more more diversity and more real representation at senior level yeah i you know i i think it does come back to what i was saying about edi you know i think we do have a lot more awareness around equality and diversity mm -hmm. issues. Yeah. But I think when it comes to genuinely including those people in conversations, I think we've got a long way to go. Yeah. Um, and I think in real honesty, that can be quite a surface level conversation Yeah. Um, yeah. about actually what targets are we setting um, rather than what perspectives are we hearing from and what lived experience um, are we hearing. And in, in my work, actually, a lot of this stems from the value of lived experience and proximity to social problems. Mm -hmm. in, in my line of work, we talk a lot about the work of the, in the global north and the global south and the fact that, it's a simplification I know, but you can talk about how we have access to resource and talent and ideas in the global north and we have, you know, some of the biggest environmental global challenges in the global south. It's not that simple, but mm -hmm. how do we ensure that some of the leaders and the solutions from the global south are being heard and being given a platform yes. opportunity yes because otherwise it all feels very parachuted in it all feels very 20, 20th century you know, look look at how international aid is done mm -hmm. and i think there's an opportunity for yeah for example impactful business business doing good mm -hmm. to look at things slightly differently yeah there's so many incredible talented social entrepreneurs in countries in the global south as yes. well as in the global north yes so you know whether you're a business of one or two people in the boardroom is you or whether you're a scaling a business or, or you've reached scale, mm -hmm. I think if we're starting from that point of view of that lived experience, it should become second nature. I think a lot of the places we're, we're struggling with right now are where you've got traditional businesses that have been around a long time yes. that are trying to adapt yeah. and adopt approaches and they're not really getting it. Mm -hmm. Or they're getting it at that surface level. They know some of the right words to say, but they don't necessarily know the right actions to take. And I think, genuinely, I think some of that is a lack of education and understanding mm -hmm. and of course some of it is a deliberate attempt to greenwash there's, there's no getting away from that it's both are true yeah and we can debate how much is one how much is the other yeah, yeah. but for me um i'm lucky in the work that i do often going in as a kind of external change agent or consultant or change yeah. manager or whatever you want to say to work with senior leaders particularly I, i'm thinking corporates where you know i think often they think they're making a change and it's just glacial it's it's really slow um, and, you know, being in some of those conversations often around lunch, you know, when we've got a workshop or coaching going on, but it's actually around that moment where we, yeah, we let our guard down, mm. where you really hear the perspectives about mm. diversity and, and actually we're pretty traditional mm. and not very, um, you know, what I would call enlightened, you know, who, who's to say what is or isn't enlightened, but, but often it's because they just haven't met people like that. They just haven't had those people in their consciousness in their community and their sphere they haven't had the chance that i've had i guess to 
meet people from different places, different cultures, different countries. They just haven't opened themselves up to that. I think it comes back to something you said about how, you know, some people are not prepared or they're perhaps genuinely scared to come out of their community. And I can really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. But I think if you don't, I think that can make prejudice and it can really, it can limit the, your ability to really challenge or call it out because you just don't have that lived experience of it. Yeah, yeah. And if you're not, like, remember what you said, one of your values as a lead, one of you, how you describe your leadership style is about your listening. Um, and actually, I think there, you know, listening and hearing, yeah, right? Absolutely. Because if you don't have the lived... to hear. Yeah. Not to respond. Yeah, because if you don't have the lived experience and you go and ask, there is so much asking now. And I think, but if you're going to ask, act on it. You know, if you're going to ask people and you're going to listen, then act on it. So you don't have to have the lived experience, but you do need to think about, we had um, Gabby on the podcast a couple of episodes ago, and she said, you know, one of the things that I'm trying to encourage just as that first step into, you know, thinking more inclusively even is whose voice is not in the room, you know, and whose lens are we looking through? And those two core questions, isn't it, can really, you may not know it, but just asking yourself that question, because then you think, well, who do we need here? Who do we need to consult? Who do we need to understand? You know, and it's that, and it, ju it, it shocks me. It really does shock me. It sh maybe it shouldn't, but it does shock me that we've got boardrooms who are so disconnected from the core people they serve, and they wonder why they're not getting it right or why they have workforce challenges as well yeah. because you're not going to attract the, the the what is it the UK working age population is now more diverse than ever before right so I think we have passion for this but just that call out to organizations if you are not trying to understand the diversity of your workforce and your community that you're looking after or the customers and clients that you're serving um, you are not going to attract the best workforce and actually you are not going to deliver the best performance. Simple as. Yeah, Simple ab as. absolutely. I think the gap between that more diverse workforce and the, and the diversity of the boardroom is probably widening, I suspect, which is a real shame because it shouldn't be. It should mm. be narrowing. Mm. Um, and if we look at companies of all sizes, you know, businesses, whether you're a social impact business or not, mm -hmm. they all want to be creative and innovative. Yes. But what they fail to realise yes. is if you're not diverse, it's much more difficult to be such it's, yes it is yeah, um, yeah. to deliver yeah, that yeah. innovation and yeah, a yeah. lot of innovation is about implementation mm -hmm. you can't implement it if you don't have the diverse tools talents backgrounds around senior tables um it, it just isn't going to happen and this concept um which i talk about around ethical fading that, you know, this idea that you leave your values at the boardroom door mm -hmm. it, it's too built into how we do business and how we have a conversation about um uh you know, policies practice and uh, you know almost the agenda of the meeting it's like it's expected that you would not bring your whole self in. And actually, I think that's just completely the wrong way around. Yeah. Surely you need to bring more of you, not yeah. less of you. Yeah. And I actually see sometimes the trend going the other way, which I think is really interesting and we need to really pick up on. Um, thankfully, in social enterprise, a lot of the time you will see employees on the board. Um, you will also see beneficiaries on the board. Mm -hmm. But... You know, increasingly, my work is focused not just on social enterprise, but how we bring social impact into all business. Yes. Because all business yeah. is going to have to report on their social yeah, yeah. and environmental impact. Yeah. It's just a fact of the direction of travel we're going in. But so many businesses are not prepared for that. So how do we get them there? Um, it's going to be really transformative. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like it to be transformative in a way that benefits people in society that isn't yeah. destructive. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and that widens divisions between people because we've had enough of that, I think. Mm -hmm. That le you know, the last point you're making there about widening divisions between people brings me back to what I wanted to circle back on, which was what you were touching on in that in in we're, we're sometimes seeing underrepresented groups almost jockeying for position against each other or being played off against each other. So sometimes it can be those within those groups themselves. Yeah. Other times it can be those who are included almost going, well, what about this group? What about that group? And you're this one, but what about, and all of that. So I know when we were speaking before, you you had some concerns about that and you started to touch on it. It would be really good to come back to that com that part of the conversation. Yeah, I mean, my concern is that diversity is a great and powerful thing. Mm -hmm. I think the the other side of that coin is where people splinter off into very specific, 
groups and communities that want to be quite insular mm -hmm. and not reach out beyond that. I think certainly the LGBTQ plus community, we've seen that um, to our detriment, actually. I think we've been able to achieve less change because of it. Yeah. And sometimes we've thrown trans people, bisexual people, pansexual, etc., under the bus mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. as a community, in my view. And if we can't achieve equality within our own community, then how can we expect the whole of society to do that mm -hmm. um, for a variety of reasons? But I think more broadly than that, I'm, I'm also um, a call to Ukrainian. And obviously what's happened over the last year uh, in the war with Russia and that invasion, um, it, in many ways, it, it, it makes you want to kind of hunker down in your community even more. But actually, funny enough, I mean, my response, of course, to that conflict was for the family I have the living in Ukraine now, mm. are they safe and how can mm. we support them? And thankfully they are. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, it's about how do we bring conflicts like this to an end? It's not about who wins and who loses. It's about actually in 2023, is this still happening? Mm -hmm. Um, I suspect most people are, for better or for ill, bringing in um, conversations around what's happening in the Middle East into mm -hmm. discussions like mm -hmm. this right now because mm -hmm. it's so polarising mm -hmm. and everybody has a view and it's, I think, increasingly hard to to honestly share your authentic opinion on these issues mm -hmm. um, because there's such a pressure on social media and in the yeah. public eye to, to say or not say certain things. But for me, what's fundamental in all this is that people... Uh, are dying mm -hmm. in both mm -hmm. of these conflicts mm -hmm. and many others. We mm -hmm. haven't even spoken about uh, Sudan mm -hmm. or, or the terrible events in Somalia and around the world where people are dying in conflict a lot of the time or yes. through climate conflict. Yeah. And we're just not thinking about the people at all. Mm -hmm. It's about countries, it's about groups, it's about ethnicity, but it's not about the humanity. Mm -hmm. uh, I think if we remember the humanity, really think hard about the humanity, I think then we make better decisions. Mm. And I would, I would always encourage people in whatever conflict or, or opinion you have on these conflicts, if you're caught up in it directly or if you're you know, very much removed from it, but have a view yeah. to think about the humanity. Mm. Because I think it, it, it can be transformative when it comes to solutions, but also how we, how we talk to each other, yeah. how we speak to each other. Yeah, you know, really, really powerful advice there. And thank you for bringing it up, because as you said, a lot of people shy away from it. People are frightened. People working in for organizations are frightened or have been sanctioned. Yes. Um, and actually what you're saying there applies to so much. We all have different views. We have different um, beliefs that we stand up for. Yeah. But if you said, if you keep humanity at the core of what you're trying to do and achieve, um, it really gives you a different viewpoint, doesn't it? And if yes. we're losing that, where are we? Yeah, right, that absolutely. It really is where are we? You, what you were saying there as well, I wanted to um, touch on what you were speaking about when you almost have, you splinter off. You know, yeah. so people have the champion of cause and there's a particular cause within a cause, yeah. if I say it like that. One of the conversations we had on a previous episode was about networks and we were talking about specialist networks and then macro networks. Yeah. And I think there, there is beauty in having very specialized groups and networks and people champion a ver championing a very specific mm. cause, when it becomes even more effective is when those micro networks and those smaller groups can come together yes. collectively, isn't it? And then champion for each other or pull out the commonality of what we're talking about here and step forward together. And I think you're so right in that where it becomes very fractured and then you start to go against each other, we lose the opportunity. So those who are in the majority go, well, look, look at all of this now. Yeah. You know, look at them infighting. It's that, you know, and it's, and it's that bit about, let's not lose the opportunity of our voice. Yeah. Yes, be very clear about what you specialize in or that particular cause that you're championing. I think it's, we need that because yeah. it can get lost in yes. the mire, isn't it? But also recognize when you can come back together and form those super groups, you know, and form those macro networks that come together collectively because we'll have more opportunity to influence, isn't it, with that collective power. So I really, I really hear what you're saying there and just wanting to tease that out a little bit about that guidance. Nothing wrong no. with a specialised cause, but try not to infight. Right. Absolutely. It's, I think it's when inclusivity becomes exclusivity. <laughs> Within, uh, the inclusive. Within the inclusivity. <laughs> and we kind of forget what I we were trying it. to do in the first place. Mm -hmm. And like you mm -hmm. say, what about, how do we build coalitions? Mm -hmm. um, I, I said I've done a bit of work in politics and I've, I've campaigned on 
both sides of the pond in, in America and then in the UK um, with, with the Democrats in the US and with the Labour Party here in the UK because mm-hmm. I'm a big believer in centre-left solutions to some of the world's biggest problems you know whoever the vehicle for that may be and I remember going out and campaigning with the Obama campaign in 2012 in Virginia mm-hmm. and having so many really powerful conversations with people on the doorsteps I've, I've had thousands of conversations on doorsteps in the UK and in, in the US I love talking to people in all different environments even if you've never met them before it's just for a few minutes yeah um, and you learn so much about what makes people tick, who they are, what, what they care about. And, you know, they don't really break down by who they vote for. That's mm-hmm. just one small aspect of who they are. But they do have values mm-hmm. and, and things that they believe in and care about. Often yes. That's related to family and, again, where they've grown up and who are their friends and who is in their network. And that obviously impacts on how they see the world. But what has struck me over those 10 years, the last 10 years, if you like, is how I do think we have seen ourselves less part of a broader coalition or society or um or humanity have a bigger group you want to see it as and i think at our cost too insular and too much as individuals or smaller groups i I think there's been a move away from that how do we work together Mm -hmm. to create change and yeah it's increasingly about how can i deliver change for me or you know it's become a little bit too much about the ego and not enough about actually how do we how do we really meaningfully work together? Yeah. I think that starts with listening mm-hmm. and it starts with getting out of your office and getting out of the comfort zone. I think for everybody, mm-hmm. um, I tell myself that every week because how, how am I going to put myself in a, a new situation to mm-hmm. have a different conversation that's going to surprise me and that's going to challenge me and that's going to make me do things better or differently? There's a call to action there, isn't it? Yes, if you want to start now, how do I, yeah, how yeah. do I have a, put myself out of my comfort zone and have a different conversation yeah. that's going to challenge me too? I love that. That that is that is gold there. So, if someone was listening to this, because I feel very pumped after listening to you, right? So I feel like, yeah, I can do this. You know, like I've, I can do this, and uh, you know, my my energy or my desire to drive change will make a difference. So you've, I really feel encouraged and inspired by what you've shared. What if our listeners are? So you just said it there about you know get out of your comfort zone, get away from your desk. So what if we've got listeners who are in a corporate career, you know, not poo-pooing it, but just feel inspired or have been thinking about, you know, I really want to think about making a transition, moving into a space more around social change and social impact. What advice would you give to them? Yeah, there's there's sort of micro changes you can make and there are bigger leaps, Mm. uh, I suspect, and Mm -hmm. some people will be more comfortable or have perhaps the opportunity and and sometimes also the kind of safety blanket to be fair to make changes like that I'm always very aware especially as a coach you can sit down and and listen and 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 guide but I would never tell somebody to definitively make a change based on my lived experience because it's Mm. just it's my lived experience Mm. Um, and I don't know the whole of them and uh, they've got to where they've got to but you know there, there are small things like having that conversation that's surprising with somebody you weren't expecting to inside, outside the company. Um, for me, I'm, I'm really passionate about people voting. Um, even if we may not have um, always the most inspiring choices in our politicians, mm-hmm. I would say, of whatever colour, I think actually getting out there and sort of demonstrating our democratic right to have our voice heard is important still. I hear you. Um, and also things like volunteering in local community groups, understanding people that live around the corner, perhaps mm-hmm. you've never had a, a conversation with somebody on your road where you live, that can also give you inspiration or ideas. Yeah. And then absolutely, of course, depending on where you are and, and how ambitious you want to be, maybe you've got that business idea. Maybe you've got something that, you know, there's something that is really itching that, I, you know, I'm irritated by. I see something in society that isn't working. I've got a bit of experience. I've got some skills. I've got a bit of capital. I want to give it a go I might do it as a side hustle you know and it's sort of bouncing around and there's a bit of a journey you can go on there mm. some people would make the leap and start it and some people will see it as a kind of oh, we'll do it on the weekend or I'll get my friend involved or that's all good actually um, but it's little moments that kind of come together it's I, I, I'm not a big believer in it all happens bang bang like that yeah. I think actually good and bad I'm afraid it, it tends to be little things that add up or moments that come together so try and create a few moments if they're not happening. Yeah. Um, but what better way than, you know, having a few conversations with people or, or listening to people you hadn't heard from? Mm-hmm. Um, or better yet, you don't agree with. 
Well, I love I love what you shared because you've taken us expansive, yes. right? But then you're bringing it back down to go, but this is what you can do. You know, you can take this small step of action and that may spark something for you. That may spark, oh, I love that. I love that because, you know, you hear it. And as I said, I see you as a leader in this space and I'm like, whoa. But actually bringing it back down to, well, this is what you can do, I think is really, really helpful. So... Can I say one more thing of on course, that quickly? Uh, just on the point of disagreement, because I feel this is really important. In 2023, I think we've lost the ability to disagree with each other mm-hmm. and to do it in a respectful way where we learn something mm-hmm. and not take it personally. Um, and it's, of course, very easy for me to sit here and say this, and people may have heard this before, but I think our ability to really listen to people we don't agree with and take something out of it, yeah. and it doesn't change our mind, yeah. which is fine. You don't have to change your mind. Is so powerful. And I think if we lose that, that it's so hard to put, things back together after conflict you know whatever however big or small the conflict is if we really think about it i might fundamentally disagree with person x but i've no doubt i can learn something from their lived experience how they form their opinion how i took a different road if we're not listening i think we're becoming more and more insular mm-hmm. and i think ultimately that's more often than not to our cost and it may, and I think it, you know, thank you. Thank you for adding that because I think it also makes us even more polarised, right? I don't want to talk to people. I don't want to interact with anyone who doesn't look, sound, think like me. Yeah. So you become more and more insular. And it, it really circles back to what we were talking about, about the fear of difference and diversity. Because I, I, like, I describe it as the fear of difference and diversity. It circles back to that. You've shared so many points. Mm. You, you, you've given me, you've really provoked thought in me in this conversation, actually. I'm going to listen to this episode a few times and just ignore myself while I'm listening to it. But you really have. If the same has happened for listeners, where can they find out more about you and Cambio House of Social Change? Well, you know, I, I always welcome conversations with people. And mm. of course, I can share website addresses and email mm. accounts, and all, you know, LinkedIn and all those things. I'm very happy to do that. And, mm-hmm. you know, uh, I think it's cambioconsultancy.uk is the website to hear a bit more but um, what I'm in the business of is conversations I'm in the business of people um, I'm a big believer that business is people it's not money the money flows from the relationships not the other way around yeah so you know I, I would invite your listeners to keep listening but also to engage in those conversations with me with each other mm-hmm. I think that's where the magic happens mm-hmm. um, and it's a, it's a small cost of time and energy actually to have a really powerful conversation that mm. could unlock all sorts of ideas motivation things that you haven't thought about in a long time so yeah i mean i would in, I, I would love people to reach out if they want to get involved in whether it be starting a social enterprise yes joining a board of a community organization at whatever level always happens to talk about that i've been very lucky in in some of the opportunities i've had and yeah if i can help in any way i'd love to wonderful what a wonderful opportunity thank you for that my very last question, because you are a busy man <laughs> and I've had a lot of your time. So you, you touched on it at the beginning about, you know, the busyness of running your own business. Mm. But do you achieve any balance in there? And if you do, how do you look after your well-being? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, the honest truth is I'm not as good at this as I, I should be. Um, I am very good at throwing more time at things if I feel like they're not right. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is at the detriment, I think, of you know my, that if you like that work-life balance I think it, when you run a business you, you have to draw your own red lines as I call them mm-hmm. um, and it's easy to, to share that advice than it is to take it yourself <laughs> yeah. uh, and I, you know you yes. listeners and probably and maybe you know, everyone in this room will recognise that actually sometimes we say one thing and we do a different thing so on this occasion I'm sort of hands up actually I'm not good at this uh, I spend far too much time because I'm so passionate about these issues mm-hmm. um, and coming up to the festive break as we are yeah. it's a real opportunity for me to actually spend time with family I'm a big believer at this time of year spending as much time with family partner yes. we've got two wonderful cats at home yeah. uh, our little babies you know just to have to recharge and and, uh, and de-stress and take a moment because you know you're always on mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. you the off button is there for a reason <laughs> you do need to switch it off so I'm looking forward over the next few weeks to doing that but I know that I, I need to find techniques and ways of looking at mindfulness and approaches to kind of recentering myself. And that, that's what I'm looking for, actually. That's my goal going to next year is how do I find ways um, of looking inside myself? Mm-hmm. Uh, because you, 
you know, I want to keep going on this journey. Yeah. You can't, you've got to switch off sometimes. 100%. You can't keep running at a marathon speed the whole time. Ooh. So that's my lesson to myself, I think, to, to switch off. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I, what, a, what a great point to end on in terms of, you know, this has been an honest and insightful conversation. And I think, you know, I really respect you doing an honest note to self there, an honest call to action for yourself. You gave a great call to action to our audience, but actually... I would love to revisit a conversation with you in um, 2024 and we can see how you're getting on with your self-care. So thank you so much, Peter. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for having me. You're welcome.